it, it's easy now to look back and say it was obvious, but we were criticized. Uh, Brian and I would give talks at MIT and one professor I remember who I will not name uh, said, oh, I can make yeast age. I just put them in the autoclave. And he totally missed the point of what we were doing. And it, it was disheartening, but we, we had the guts to do it. And the other thing I, I will tell you is every time uh, we made a big discovery, uh, I knew it was important because people would tell us that it, it could not be true. And that continued through my whole career. So have the guts to believe in yourself, do the best science you can, make sure it's right and reproducible, and then stand by it and just continue on. And if you have critics, you actually, it's actually a good thing because I don't know anybody who's successful who doesn't have critics. So it's, there, will, there will be advances that are that will together have a big impact, similar to cancer, where we have chemotherapy and then we add immuno-oncology therapies. And we have made a lot of progress. There's a lot of uh, people who are alive today that would have died from cancer exactly. 20 years ago. Um, and so it's going to be the same. We're not going to all suddenly live 100 years longer, but we are going to slowly live longer and longer and longer. But I think there are two differences. One is that Treating aging seems to be much easier than treating cancer. Uh, I wrote that in my book and a lot of people were surprised by that. But while cancer is literally hundreds of different diseases, the main drivers of aging are, are common across the body and the protectors against aging, such as the sirtuins, uh, are common in tissues. So if we can target those, uh, I think we have a good chance of, of going faster than cancer. Uh, and then the, the other reason is that uh, with, uh, with aging, we actually uh, um, don't have uh, the issue where we, we have to rely on 20th century technology. We can do a million experiments today uh, that would take a decade back in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to develop drugs and find new ways to treat aging uh, is exponentially faster than it used to be. Maybe we can uh, uh, talk a little bit about sirtuins. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, you're, you know, worked a lot on SIRT1, uh, and I, you're probably very still very bullish on the idea of SIRT1 regulating aging. There's seven sirtuins, so maybe we can start broadly though. And um, which are the other sirtuins that excite you, and why would this class of proteins uh, regulate aging? Well, uh, so there are seven of them. There are three enzymes in the nucleus, and uh, there are three in mitochondria, one that's cytoplasmic. And they play protective roles throughout the cell. There's now thousands of papers uh, since Brian's first one that show that sirtuins protect cells and protect tissues against the ravages of time and aging. Um, and there are, there are a number of studies that show they affect the aging process as well. Uh, the one that seems to be the most potent or perhaps the easiest to use in an animal is SIRT6. SIRT6 is uh, similar to SIRT1 in that it binds to chromatin and regulates genes uh, and also is involved in DNA repair, broken DNA repair. And what, what's been striking is that uh, Heim Cohen, a former postdoc in my lab, has shown now in a number of different ways that SIRT6 is a longevity gene. And when you make a mouse that overexpresses it, it will be healthier and lives lives longer and is resistant against diseases such as type 2 diabetes. Uh, now, what's exciting about that is that you can activate SIRT6 just like you can activate SIRT1 with small molecules. And that's what these companies are doing is to find uh, a, a drug that could activate SIRT6 to treat a variety of diseases. Cancer is one possibility. Uh, but also it could be one of the first molecules to s truly slow down the aging process.
We've done a lot of work on SOTI-1 and, and NAD's role, right? I mentioned earlier, raise NAD in, in the endothelium and block SOTI-1. Um, I think it's just because of lab's preference, not because of biology. Uh, Haim, who works on SOTI-6, and Raul Mostoslavsky and Vera Gorbanova, they, they just they don't think about NAD. But I would be surprised if it's not as, just as important for SOTI-6 as it is for SIR T1, it's just that the, the experiments haven't been done yet. Yeah, well, I'm, I don't sell anything on the internet, so I don't really care which is better at this point. Um, some professors do sell stuff and uh, they're often out there claiming that NR is better than NMN. NR is used by the body to make NMN, by the way. Um, you know, I, I, I do go on data and in mouse experiments and, and Matt Cabellone, our, our, our colleague, agrees that NMN has a more potent effect compared to NR head to head in some areas. Um, no one's done a human clinical comparison of NR versus NMN to raise NAD. Um, and so it, these arguments are really semantic. Um, what I can tell you is that NMN and molecules like NMN work really well in people to raise NAD levels two to three fold in the blood, uh, in white blood cells. Uh, and we're doing trials here at Harvard and uh, around the country in the US to treat diseases. Uh, and so we're looking at one particular disease called Friedrich's ataxia. Uh, we're also looking at muscle strength, oxygenation, endurance. Um, and so I'm hopeful that at least for NMN we'll have some really clear and hopefully positive human data uh, using NMN or molecules similar to it to treat a human condition. And those results will be coming out early next year. But I don't like getting into the de debate about which molecule is better. There's a whole supplement war out there that to me is something I don't even want to get into. Um, and I want to just see the data. And I, I wish people would do more head to head studies of these molecules rather than just theoretically try to predict which one's better or base it on which one they want to sell more of. On NMN head to head in those endurance, those treadmill studies, mm -hmm. um, and NMN was superior at the same concentration uh, for reasons we don't know, uh, and, and, and you know, I, I don't even need to know. Uh, but that's, that's one important data point that based on that, NMN was working better. The, by far the risk, biggest risk factor is, is age, you know, like 10 times more than anything else. And uh, by, by reversing or improving the age and the resilience of the body in old age, I think is, is the best approach besides vaccines to be able to deal with this and future pandemics. And the reason is that the, as the body gets older, the immune system declines and, and overreacts often to an in, invading uh, organism or virus. And we we know from studies that if you regenerate or improve the health of the body, it can fight diseases. And there are a number of clinical trials uh, using molecules that are thought to slow aspects of aging or reverse it. There's a trial with NMN, uh, there's a trial with NR, uh, metformin, and even rapamycin. Uh, and then there's another class which we haven't brought, brought up called senolytics, which seem to also be important, um, particularly in treating long COVID, which may in fact be driven in part by those accumulation of senescent cells in the body. So yeah, I think that really a lot of focus should be put on uh, treating aging itself as a way to allow older people to combat uh, COVID-19 and other infectious diseases.